Hey everyone, Vito from Morbier here. We're in Chico, California, outside Sierra Nevada Brewing. We're gonna go inside and talk to the founder, Ken Grossman, one of the most pivotal people in the beer industry about Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, what's happening in the beer industry, and all kinds of other good stuff. Check it out. All right, Ken, hey, thanks for having us. On behalf of More Beer, I wanna say thank you. And I think on behalf of the entire home brewing and brewing industry, thank you for the amazing uh, brewery and, and your product that you've created over the years. Well, thank you. Thanks for all the support. And, and uh, we've actually bought some stuff from you guys over the years as well. Yeah, yeah, I've seen, uh, I've seen some of our products around here. So mm -hmm. it's really cool to see that. So thank you again. All right, so let's jump in. So the first thing I wanna do is kind of talk about your history and the history of Sierra Nevada. So I did an interview at Oak Barrel Winecraft uh, with, with Homer in, in Berkeley. So mm -hmm. it's a homebrew store, one of the oldest homebrew stores in the Bay Area. And he had mentioned that you had bought ingredients from him back in, I think, the 60s or the 70s, you yep. know. Uh, so uh, can you tell me a little bit about that story or, or you know, home, your interaction with, with Oak Barrel? Sure, um, actually it even goes back before Oak Barrel. So. I grew up in Southern California and I lived uh, in San Fernando Valley and, and that's where uh, one of the very first homebrew clubs and I think the first homebrew club in, in the U.S., uh, Maltos Falcons, oh, started. Yeah. And they started a couple years after I was homebrewing and I had moved uh, to Chico in, in 1972. Uh, but I started homebrewing in the late 60s and uh, went to the home wine shop down there and, and bought supplies and, and uh, started making beer in my closet hidden from my mom. and then. Uh, Got a bit more advanced and started to grain brewing uh, pretty early on and, and then moved up to Chico in uh, 1972 and continued my home brewing. I'm 17, uh, continued my home brewing and attended uh, Butte Junior College, studied chemistry and then Chico State and uh, continued to, to brew and decided I would open up a homebrew supply store myself. Mm. And uh, Chico you know, was a very small town back then, um, actually I think under 40,000 population and uh, when the students came it, it swelled a little bit but um, it was hard to, to buy in the quantities to supply my homebrew supply store so I started um, leaning on some uh, other homebrew shops that were more established uh, Oak Barrel being one of them, Wine and the People being another one, uh, By Byron Birch was down there back then and uh, so I, I would you know, buy 20 airlocks at a time from them and they they give me a good break so uh, that was my go-to um, as far as getting supplies that I couldn't afford to, to buy on my own as a really small home brute supplier. That's awesome. That was it was it was cool that you know when we were going over that to, to have, have mentioned your name and you know my eyes lit up mm -hmm. and it was amazing. Uh, tell me a little bit about so because homebrewing didn't become legal until 1978, right? Right. So what was the scene like back then, or you know, was it kind of like you know, eh, you could use this, but it's not like distilling is today, kind of? Or? Um, no, actually, it was more accepted than that. Um, okay. the, the scene was, um, yeah, although it was illegal, uh, we'd never heard of anybody getting arrested, and and so most home wine shops did have a beer section. Uh, and even in Chico, back when I moved here in '72, you could get a little bit of homebrew supplying supplies at one of the downtown local drugstores. Uh, they had a little homebrew mm. corner in the drugstore, and they had you know malt extract and cans and and old crummy hops and and uh, you know packaged yeast that wasn't very good. But so uh, when I opened my homebrew shop, it was really to further the the craft and art of homebrewing. So I was hooked up with uh, with hop suppliers. I would go up to Yakima every year. I drove my station wagon up there and would load it up with uh, one pound bricks of uh, hop samples. So the samples that normally would go to brewers for uh, selection. Um, you could, well, they sold me uh, you know, 100 one pound bricks of every variety being grown uh, at the time, which wasn't that many. It was it was it whole cone at the time or was it T90 pellets? Uh, all whole cone. All whole cone yep. at the time, okay. Yep. Um, and we got brewers cuts and then I made some friends in the industry and uh, and hooked up with a European supplier, so I was able to bring in European uh, hops. And then uh, the UK had a pretty uh, vibrant homebrew scene, uh, although uh, more catering to making cheap beer at home rather than making great beer at mm -hmm. home. Um, you know, today it's completely different. Um, there's all yeah. sorts of stuff, stuff available, and um, you know, way more knowledge on on really the science and art of brewing than than um, I I had available to me. Uh, but I got pretty serious as a home brewer, and was, you know, we were culturing our own yeast, and um, I built a pretty good sized cooler so I could make lagers, and and uh, so I was fairly advanced and went to. Uh, my first conference, I think it was the first conference of, uh, of homebrew and wine suppliers, 
uh, down in Oakland. And mm. um, I attended that and met people I'd known from the industry, um, um, Fred Eckhart being probably the, the lead one. And, and you know, I've been corresponding the old way back then, no email back in that era. So yeah. I was writing letters back and yeah. forth about you know uh, different beer things. And he was writing articles and he had a, some publications. So we chatted and, and I arranged a tour of the Anchor Brewery um, at the time with Fritz Maytag uh, giving us the tour. Uh, this was the old brewery, so this was underneath the freeway um, mm, before previous Petrero, be, okay. before Petrero, yeah. and um, m met him and, and was pretty inspired and, and then uh, arranged a visit to uh, New Albion, which had just mm. recently opened. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, I think, around 70, late 77, 78, when I w went and visited him the first time. And saw what he had built, which was, um, you know, pretty high-end glorified homebrew setup for the time. Um, certainly it was way more advanced than you know, what uh, anybody else that I was aware of was doing. Um, and he was brewing a barrel and a half, you know, 45 gallons per batch. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, and it was him and he had a partner, Susie Stern, and uh, saw what they were doing. I'm like, yeah, I could do this. Um, and um, came back home, I think after first or second trip there, and decided to put my homebrew shop up for sale and, and start writing a business plan to open a brewery. So that was um, 78. 78, when you, uh, I, I know, knowing your history, uh, cobbling together a system, I want to as someone who built a brewery myself and cobbling it together on a budget, um, tell me a little bit about that. Because I think at the time there wasn't as many brewing supply or commercial brewing supplies. There, there weren't any. Yeah, yeah. There weren't any in the U.S. <laughs> making small equipment anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, you know, if we knew better, if we knew, we could have gone to Europe probably and found somebody to make a small brew house that had experience. But in the U.S., there was really just a handful of large equipment suppliers, and I think they're mostly all gone now. But um, there was a couple that were servicing, um, you know, Anheuser-Busch and Miller and all that. But the U.S. brewing industry back in 1978, 1980, it was down to about 40 total brewing companies in America. That's wow. All of them, you know, Anheuser Busch down to the smallest, and, and you know the small small brewers back then were, you know, regional um, family breweries that had survived prohibition in some fashion, and were you know, trying to eke out a living, living and, and competing against the big brewers, and it wasn't a very healthy uh, part of the industry back then. Brewers were closing at a pretty rapid rate in mm. the in the U.S. and you know, it hit its low point around 1980 when we started, um, and I think there were. I can't remember if there was 34 or 43, but there was uh, around that many total brewing companies. Uh, so everything was cobbled together from dairy equipment and dairy and, equipment and, yeah. and other food processing equipment. And Jack McAuliffe, you know, he had sort of shown that you can be pretty primitive and simple and and make good beer. Um, and he was using 55 gallon stainless steel drums that had been used for um, soda syrup, uh, Coke or Pepsi or something. Mm. Um, and he had converted all those into you know, mash tun and kettle and, and I can't remember what he used for fermenters, but pretty primitive. I think maybe it was 55 gallon barrels for everything. Um, and so when, when I was looking at what, what he was doing, realized that his business plan was pretty flawed to, to try to you know, support two people on a barrel and a half a day. Um, and he was you know, doing it all himself, the two of them. They would you know, brew and bottle and he'd load it in his van and drive around and try to sell it. So no even tap room, it was just... No tap room, out. no. Oh, pub, yeah. Pubs were not a thing then. There was mm -hmm. no brew pubs uh, at that point. Um, but for us, you know, on paper anyway, we thought, you know, 10 barrel batches, that's a nice round number, 300 gallons or 10 gallons. And, uh, you know, that at least on paper looked like that could be a, a, a business that would support uh, my partner and myself. I had, a, I had joined up with one of my homebrew shop customers, uh, Paul Camuzzi, mm. and, and we... Uh, th thought we could make a go of it at that kind of volume if we could sell, I think our business plan called for us to sell 2,500 barrels a year and expansion plans to grow to 3,500 barrels a year. And at 3,500 barrels a year, at least on paper, we'd be doing you know well enough to, to support us. So that was the, the plan and we started to build equipment. And um, I had been a welder when I was in college, or actually when I, when I was in high school, uh, in junior high even, I started welding um, and I, Went back to Butte College, which had been the school I started out uh, up in Chico studying chemistry, and I went back and enrolled in 
welding and fabrication. I enrolled in every class that they offered that had shop access. So it was farm mechanics and, and um, ag, ag repair and all these classes that gave me access to uh, the shop with uh, you know lathe and drill press and welders. and Great skills to have knowing, you know, having gone through commercial brewing is like you're a chemist, you're an engineer, you're a you know, janitor. <laughs> like, so these are all great skills yep. that are uh, transferable into that. So speaking of that, uh, Chris Graham, our, our president, uh, said, make sure to ask you this, so I want to ask you this question. Your very first batch, he said you told him a story about how you got the grain for that batch, and could you share that story with us? Yeah, so um, uh, thankfully I had um, uh, a good relationship, and, and Fritz Maytag and the crew there at Anchor were, uh, were quite helpful. Uh, I got to know Mark Carpenter and Gordon McDermott uh, pretty well, and, and Fritz, and and so I leaned on them a fair amount to just sort of understand, you know, how they made beer and, and you know how they got equipment and how they got uh, ingredients. And, and so um, they said, oh yeah, Bauer Schweitzer malting. So there was a malt house in downtown San Francisco, uh, right by Fishman's Wharf, um, that uh, had been around. Actually, the uh, building had been damaged during the San Francisco earthquake, so it had been around pre. Uh, pre-earthquake and, um, and actually I have a door off one of the malting drums hanging in the hallway out here. Oh, that's cool. Um, but they had this old drum malt house um, and I'd never been to a commercial malt house before. Um, and so I got a tour of the malt house, it was totally cool and, and again this is a really old malt house. Um, I think the, the malting drums were from um, right around the turn of the century. Mm. So big cast iron drums and they would malt sort of small batches uh, in these drums. Um, and they got bought by Flashman Malting at some point. But that's where Fritz got his malt from, that's where New Albion got their malt from, and so it was like the logical place. So I drove my 57 Chevy down with two bins on the back, drove to the malt house, and uh, they were used to loading rail cars. So mm -hmm. the, the area that you would drive a rail car through, it got tracks, you could pull your truck under we'll there. there. <laughs> and uh, the, the chute was, you know, two feet in diameter, and yeah. the, the guy opens the chute up and you know, fills, fills, bin, pretty quick. fills both bins <laughs> up, and, and, um, and they drive you over the scale, you know, they weigh you on the way in, and they weigh you on the way out. And uh, I had just under 10,000 pounds um, on the truck, and it was. What's it rated at? Are you and not that. It was yeah. a one-ton truck, so yeah, that, <laughs> you know, I got four tons of, of weight on it, and uh, single, single axle, single tires, and so the truck is like that. Yeah. And I said, you got to take half that off. They're like, no way, it's yours. We're never, we're not taking that back. We can't do that. It's yours. Yeah. So I'm like, shit. So driving, I can only go about 35 miles an hour, going up the freeway on ramp to get out of San Francisco. And uh, the max speed, I think, was a little over 40 is all I could go. Mm. And I'm sliding on the road. I mean, the whole rear end is just fishtailing. Yeah, because your steering's up yeah, front. Right. Yeah, so. <laughs> I got pulled over, finally got pulled over by high patrol, but I was almost home. And the guy felt sorry for me and didn't take me and didn't let me go. Um, um, but I got back to, to Chico. I was like, okay, next time, one, one bin, not two bins. And um, you know, cut the load in half. Um, but anyway, that was our, our first... Uh, Load of malt from Bauer Schweitzer, and I brewed uh, November 15, 1980, five barrels of stout was brew number one. And um, we knew we weren't going to sell it, and we figured, you know, stout would hide our sins, uh, Age you know, well strong, strong flavors, while, and yeah. yeah, so we, uh, that was brew number one. And then went into pale ale brewing uh, two days later, um, and um, pale ale number one was pretty good. And uh, um, we thought, okay, that, you know, we're close. We made some tweaks to the recipe, and, and uh, Pale Ale 2 was a little different. Didn't have quite as good of a fermentation, and it wasn't quite right. Um, and we repropagated. So we were doing all of our own yeast propagation back then. Uh, we always, always have. And uh, propagated up more yeast from uh, another slant. And, and uh, Pale Ale 3 was pretty good, and I was, uh, n good enough that we bottled a little bit of it. And we were like, okay, we gave it to family and friends. This is sort of what, you know, what we're planning on producing. Um, and then after that, you know, we were cereal cropping, so we were harvesting yeast and, and mm. repitching. Speaking of yeast, you said, uh, you know, so I know it as Chico 01. Was yeah. it referred to that as, as back oh, no. then? Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, we had our own yeast library. Okay. Um, you know, as, as home brewers. So this was back in the late 70s, and you, you couldn't really buy, you know, there was no yeast labs that were certainly catering to a craft brewer because, you know, there really wasn't such a thing. 
Um, so we got yeast from all the different collections around the globe, um, some from the British collection and some from Weinsteffen and uh, Davis had some yeast and uh, Siebel was, was a, a, a fairly, it was about the last of the American commercial brewing labs. Um, right when we started to build the brewery, I think Wallerstein had just gone out of business uh, and that was another lab. I mean, brewers back in, in that era, uh, small commercial brewers, a lot of them didn't have really much in the way of labs. And, and again, these are, uh, you know, historic brewers, you mm -hmm. know, the Junglings and the, the um, uh, August Shells and those kinds of historic family breweries. Uh, they didn't have, you know, really dedicated lab staff, and so they couldn't do a lot of the analysis themselves. And so the industry really had a handful of, of commercial labs with you know master brewers and chemists and all that so you would send your samples off that was pretty standard you know to do most of the analysis that was you know above you know a specific gravity or you know alcohol or co2 uh, and maybe you know do uh, those things most brewers had some way of testing um, nothing like we have today so most breweries relied on these laboratories that were a few of them around the country to do a lot of that analysis. Well, as the industry sort of was on its way down, uh, a lot of those labs went out of business because mm. the big brewers had labs and they didn't really need to, you know, send out their samples anymore. Yeah, so, 40 breweries out there, there's not much business for right. them. So Siebel was the last. And so anyway, we got all these different yeasts and, and we, uh, we were brewing every week during the year and a half, almost two year construction phase of the brewery. So every week we'd make a batch of pale ale um, mm -hmm. and um, try different yeast, try you know different hops, try different water treatment, uh, all, all those kinds of things that a brewer would do. Um, and we finally you know realized we were going to be a bottle conditioned brewery. Uh, we didn't have pressurized tanks. We didn't have any way to carbonate mm -hmm. naturally or artificially, and and so we just figured we, we'll bottle condition just like we've been doing as home brewers. And um, we needed a yeast that was uh, ferment fast, um, uh, attenuate well, fall out and, and stick to the bottom of the bottle and, and, and leave a you know, very firm yeast sediment for yeah, bottle Stay in the bottle and stay in, in the bottle. glass. Right. <laughs> so um, the yeast that is now Chico yeast was one that we thought had all those qualities that, that we really needed for um, commercial and bottle condition uh, production. Uh, it was pretty you know, robust. Um, we uh, you know, are very fortunate UC Davis was not too far away, and so as part of our learning, um, I spent a lot of time at the Davis Library and talking to grad students and, and Dr. Michael Lewis, who was the, mm -hmm. ran the program back then. And you know, they were like, you know, you probably shouldn't try to do lager brewing with as primitive as your brewery is. You know, you definitely use a top fermenting yeast. And, and so you know, we had realized that was you know, the direction we have to start out with. And then so we you know, tried to optimize uh, what we thought we needed in a bottle conditioning yeast and our, our yeast is the same yeast we're still using today. Well, again, on behalf of uh, the entire home brewing and brewing industry, thank you for developing one of the, the workhorses of the brewing industry and one of my favorite uh, yeast strands. All right, so let's talk about uh, my favorite beer, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. I, I call it my desert island beer style. So meaning if I could only have one beer for the rest of my life, I would pick this one. Mm -hmm. um, what is one beer that, that, that would be your desert island beer style? Well, certainly Pale Ale would be, would be in there. If I only had one beer, it'd probably be Pale Ale. But the other one, which we're brewing and packaging first batch this year, uh, next week is Celebration Ale. Ah, uh, yes. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's one that I brewed uh, our first full year of production, uh, brewed, uh, I think, 96 cases of Celebration Ale in 1981. And um, it was, uh, you know, something I'd been to Europe at that point a couple of times, uh, UK and Belgium and Germany. And, and um, um, we were, you know, aware that, you know, Fritz was doing his Christmas beer and he was doing Liberty Ale. Um, and we really wanted to do a dry hop beer, so pale ale wasn't dry hop just due to uh, our uh, inabilities to do that initially. Um, so we were like, okay, we want to make a dry hop beer, uh, we want to make a holiday beer. And, and back um, you know, in the 40s and 50s, there were a lot of breweries that produced Christmas beers. Um, and I've still got some old bottles of, of some of them around from U.S. brewing companies. And that sort of went away, and uh, and Fritz had revived that uh, for with his Christmas ale. So we wanted to do uh, you know a holiday ale, and, and uh, actually our, our first uh, first one is that 
white label uh, right there, the Long Neck um, wow. Celebration Ale up there. Um, and uh, that was uh, when I brewed um, less than 100 cases. And I remember going to Yakima and actually picking the field of hops we, we wanted. Uh, it was actually a baby field of Cascades. Mm. Um, but they were just uh, you know really nice uh, small cones, but just loaded with lupulin. Mm. And um, I remember thinking, God, ah, this would be great for dry hopping with. And, and so I brewed that beer, and it was you know amazing, and, and uh, really left a, you know a huge impression that we need to do more of this. And, uh, you know, more dry hopping, and, and um, so that beer's definitely got a f fondness, uh, a fun place for me as well as our pale ale, for yeah, sure. Yeah, Celebration's delicious. I yeah. love that one, too. So, uh, speaking of Sierra Nevada pale ale, one of the cool things uh, that you mentioned a minute ago, too, and uh, the bottle condition. So, mm -hmm. uh, now you guys are doing cans. So, is it can conditioned as well? It is. So, there's yeast in, in the can, and um, same as in the bottle, same pitch rate, same beer. Same pitch rate, so uh, same yeast, uh, pitching, Every, sugar, everything, all every, exact same Exact same, uh, numbers, yeah, the, okay. the, the, the beer is the same when it heads out to packaging and whether it goes in a bottle or can. And that, the, I think the, the benefit of, of bottle conditioning, can conditioning too, is it helps with the shelf life, right? With the, it, it does. Uh, the uh, yeast uh, uptake the oxygen. Yeah, so, uh, and you know, yeast keeps the beer in a reduced state, so uh, it does uh, provide some protection, uh, certainly from you know, some oxygen ingress that happens during packaging. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think uh, many brewers are aware that the oxygen actually ingresses continually into a bottle and, and less so into a can, but there is a small amount of oxygen that migrates through the seams of a, of a can lid or a bottle cap, more so in the bottle cap because of the porosity of, of the plastic they use in the liner. Um, and so there's a small amount of, of oxygen ingress that's continually happening as the beer sits on the shelf. Um, corks are the worst, and then you, know, you can go through a, a whole range of bottle caps. And um, the next worst is a Puff PBC. So the mm. Puff PBC is, besides the fact that it's got a lubricant in it, but it's what's used in a twist-off bottle cap. Gotcha. Um, but it's puffed, meaning it's got uh, oxygen in it, and it's, it's more porous, and it's got air in it when they mm. puff it. Uh, and so that porosity makes the transmission rate of oxygen higher. Um, and we did a lot of research around bottle cap liner material, and we're actually still looking at, at that. And we've you know, picked ones that have a, you know, the lowest um, amount of oxygen transmission. And then there's some you know, antioxidants that are uh, ascorbic acid that mm -hmm. are added to some of the liner materials to you know, address some of that oxygen ingress. Um, the can um, has got a much tighter seam. It still does have a, a, of a, a sealant material in the, in the can uh, seal itself. The liners, yeah. yeah. Uh, not the liner itself, but actually uh, the, when this is the cramped top. inside gotcha. there, there's a, there's a little bit of, uh, of a sealant in there as well. So there's a little bit of oxygen transmission, but it's a much tighter seal than a bottle cap and the amount of surface area is smaller. With your kegs too, would you keg condition those as well? Uh, we, uh, we do keg condition some beers. We don't keg condition all of our beers. So our pale ale on draft is actually a slightly different version. Um, we, we did use the keg condition and we still do uh, some. Uh, the issue is you've got uh, a much larger volume. You've got a tall keg and mm -hmm. you've got your yeast which settles to the bottom and the the amount of surface area uh, that the yeast has to react with the volume of beer is much less. And so a keg conditioned beer takes a lot longer to condition mm -hmm. than a bottle or a can does just because of the surface to volume ratio in a keg. And so keg conditioned beers would take a month uh, sometimes to, to fully condition. So mm -hmm. our pale ale is conditioned naturally in a, a tank, uh, but it still undergoes a secondary fermentation uh, in the tank. We bung it. and and allow it to build CO2 naturally. Uh, back on Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, uh, I think this should be an interesting one because it's been around forever. How many gallons or barrels have you guys brewed so far of this one? Um, I don't have an exact number, but it's many, many millions. Millions? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. What's your favorite Sierra Nevada beer, past or present? Um, I get asked this question pretty regularly, and okay. I, I never give a straight answer. Yeah. So um, re really, it's like you know having a favorite kid. You're not yeah. going to publicly state that. But, yeah. um, 
you know, my, my go-to um, changes a bit during the year. Um, depending on the season. Okay. Depending on the season, like I'll switch to Celebration Ale next week. Uh, so as soon as we, or the week after, as soon as we package and condition it, I'll drink Celebration um, preferentially for most of the season um, and then switch back to Pale Ale. And, and, uh, but we, you know, we produce quite a range of beers and um, I, I have been known to you know, have a um, a nitro stout, or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, one of our lagers, or, or something on a on a regular occasion. So I don't stick with just one beer. Yeah, it's kind of hard every yeah. day. Yeah. I could I could hear that. All right, what makes you passionate about beer and brewing? You know, is it an ingredient? It is the process, the science. What is your, your main major? Maybe it's kind of like the the other question. You know, like there's so many aspects, but mm -hmm. if you could narrow in on one, what makes you passionate about? It? You know, I think for me, I still do enjoy the science. Um, I, I do still spend a bit of time involved in, in uh, I guess, the research and scientific pursuit of, of improving beers. Um, you know, I've, I've had uh, a saying around the brewery for years that uh, good is never good enough. There's always places you can tweak and make improvements, whether it's, you know, oxygen control, whether it's, you know, brew house process, whether it's lower thermal stress and boiling. I mean, there. There are so many uh, areas to explore, and, and the science is not done. Um, brewing science is constantly evolving, and, mm -hmm. and there's you know things we learn all the time um, that can you know uh, do very small tweaks in many cases. But you add up ten small tweaks, and there's a noticeable improvement. So just paying attention to the little things, uh, attention to detail, really matters. Um, but for me, I'm still, you know, fascinated a bit with the science. Um, I like the engineering aspect of brewing beer, um, you know, problem solving and, yeah. and sort of working through that. You know, it's a natural and biological process, so there's always things that happen that people can't figure out. And even the, the brightest minds in the industry um, have areas where it's like, I don't know why that happened, uh, but it did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can spend um, months or years trying to delve into one little aspect of of brewing science and, and you know hopefully uncover the answer but th there's always those uh, questions as to you know what does this do in the process what does you know the, the yeast have to do on the influence of you know flavor and head retention and mm -hmm. you name it there's just a wide open uh, amount of things to learn and so I think to me the learning is also really important. I love that answer because it's like life, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you never stop learning, you never stop growing, you never stop getting better, you know, or I guess you do it one day at some point, right? But, uh, and, and, and yeah, the, we're always learning new things, so it's mm -hmm. like there's always new challenges, and you know, there's, going back, looking over, like, there's nothing new under the sun, but there is. There is new stuff coming out, you yeah. know, so it's really cool. I mean, there's lots of new stuff coming out, yeah. and the, the, you know, the brewing industry, the, the brewing, uh, or the the consumer is also evolving, and uh, you know when we started, uh, you know our pale ale was 38 bitterness units, and and uh, for most people it was a shock. I mean that was just intense flavored beer mm -hmm. compared to, you know if you were an American beer drinker in the late 70s, um, you were pretty much drinking one style of beer. You had light light lager, light, light <laughs> lager. Um, you know maybe. Cores at the time was a little hoppier. Actually, mm -hmm. they were maybe 14, 15 bitterness units, and AB was maybe 12 or 14. And uh, uh, I had an old friend who was a brewmaster at Anheuser Busch, and, and uh, you know, he told me, you know, the whole industry at that time would watch each other, and you know, they had at that point the instrumentation to analyze things down into the you know parts per million, and, and um, so they'd all watch each other's bitterness levels. And <laughs> he said, without uh, fail about every year somebody would drop one then somebody else would drop one and then somebody else would drop one bitterness unit yep, yeah. lower until they got down to um, I, I don't remember the exact numbers but you know in the eight or nine bitterness unit mm. range for some of these you know domestic loggers which was a little too low um, you know started to lose out of balance yeah. At that point, yeah so they went back up again a little bit but it, it was the uh, you know whole industry was just paying attention because people you know there was uh, you know ads um, know no bitter beer face and all, all this uh, you know kind of focus on beer being bitter and I think the you know consumers at that point you know in the 60s and 70s you know Wonder Bread and and the, mm. the um, you know after after the World War II sort of the homogenization of you know all of our food supply so mm. um, you know there was a, a blandness that sort of came over America 
um, you know, to the least offensive thing was uh, what people were trying to go for. So you didn't want to offend any consumer. Mm. So you made products that had you know very little character or flavor. And you know, when we started in the '70s, there was starting to be a, a resurgence of you know of uh, bakeries that were doing artisan stuff and little coffee roasters and some small cheese producers. And so there started to be a turn in the culture of food and drink. Uh, small wineries were starting to open up, and so. Um, you know, the coasts were where most of that was happening, the West Coast particularly, you know, the Bay Area was probably, you know, the hotbed and- you know, Close to Napa. Yeah, yeah, Oregon and Washington, you know, there were some areas there in Colorado. Um, there started to be some, some focus on, you know, uh, real food again and, mm -hmm. and uh, real drink. And, and so that was part of why we saw there was a niche that wasn't being met by the big breweries that uh, seemed like, um, you know, we could capitalize on and we didn't need to, appeal to the masses, we just needed to appeal to, you know, uh, enough people that thought what we did was, you know, was something they wanted to consume. Um, and that was sort of the genesis, I think, of, of why, you know, craft brewing sort of caught hold. It was part of that whole movement uh, across food and beverage. Yeah, it almost like went, uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s to like really bitter. Do you remember there was a point oh, yeah. where it was like 100 IBUs, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, um, yeah, you know, and to think, um, I, I remember I was interviewed in some article, uh, I don't remember what year, probably mid-80s, and, um, and my goal then, I said, God, if we can only get to 10,000 barrels, uh, that would be, you know, amazing. And, and I think I said in the article, I think that's about the limit of uh, uh, America's appreciation for hoppy beer will be about 10,000 barrels worth of <laughs> worth of people who could appreciate really hoppy beer. Uh, you know, it's obviously totally wrong. Uh, and, uh, and that was 38 barrels units. That was well mm -hmm. ahead of, of the the quest to make you know more and more um, you know hop hop forward intense beers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the consuming public, once you start to really appreciate um, you know hops and the character and the you know, intensity, um, you know, you, it's hard to go back. Um, mm -hmm. Not that you can enjoy a beer with fewer hops, but I think the, the um, you know, once you sort of appreciate and savor that really hoppy, malty balance, um, it really sets a tone that, that uh, um, you know, appeals to certainly a certain percentage of drinkers. Speaking of hops, I want to talk about one of the cool things that I think you guys uh, developed and uh, a lot of other craft brewers, um, you know, the, the torpedo is where I'm going mm -hmm. with this, but I, I used to have what I'd call the hop flavor cannon mm -hmm. or the, the, the cold side flavor. And I'd use other things, you know, it could be coffee or fruit or, you know, other things to do on the cold side. So, but I feel like you guys kind of developed that. So tell me a little bit about that history of the torpedo. Yeah, so the torpedo came out of uh, actually our our need to make more celebration ale. Um, so uh, celebration ale was always dry hopped with whole leaf hops, um, and uh, it still is. And uh, we were limited um, as we grew to how many tanks we could dry hop in. And uh, when I designed this brewery we're in today, um, we were at the old facility in the um, mid '80s, and I realized we better look at growing the company uh, and building a new brewery and we were in a you know funky metal building and equipment was primitive and and so we had this vision and so in in 80 um 7, 88, we moved over here and when i designed this brewery we were making a little over 10,000 barrels and so i designed the brewery to go to 60,000 barrels and um you know, which was a pretty bold jump and at that point i think anchor was at 35 or 40,000 and you know Fritz was like the most successful you know small brewer out there and so I thought god if we could ever you know get to 60,000 barrels it'd be amazing uh, so that was the capacity of the brewery and our first year we um, brewed over 20,000 our second year about 35,000 our third year like 45,000 and the fourth year we were out of capacity and celebration ale kept growing and we were limited to the tanks we could do this dry hopping in. And so uh, as we continued to expand, I went to conical bottom tanks and uh, we have four open 100 barrel fermenters here. That was the original design was to uh, four opens and um, a dozen 200 barrel aging tanks. And that got us to that 60,000 barrels. We had a small lager cellar with four 200 barrel tanks. Um, but we were at a celebration of capacity and um, so I started to play around with sort of an external way to uh, still use whole cone hops and to uh, infuse the beer. And so after uh, celebration ale season, we started to experiment with this. How close can we get to matching um, 
uh, our you know, original dry hopping method, which really was just filling these mesh bags full of hops and tying them into the bottom of a fermenter and filling the fermenter up with beer. And so we started this external circulation loop through, uh, through a bed of hops. And I started out, my first versions didn't work well with the, just a tube pack full of whole cone hops that we would try to force beer through. Mm. Uh, but the amount of uh, back pressure created by going through a compressed bed of, of cone hops mm. didn't, didn't work. And so as I evolved it, we made a smaller one where I put in hops in a cage and then circulated sort of around it rather than forcing it through. And that was the genesis of, of um, the hop torpedo. And um, so we, we did this after Celebration Ale season, so we couldn't call it Celebration Ale. So we morphed the recipe a little bit and, and named the beer after the device that looked like a, a torpedo. Mm. So uh, that's how we started. And, and yeah. Uh, Amazing, uh, amazing way to add flavor, not mm -hmm. just with hops, but with other things like I mentioned. Yep. Yeah, so it's uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, whole cone hops, you said that a couple times. So I know you guys use a lot of whole cone hops. Mm -hmm. I think you use more whole cone cascade than anyone, probably, right? Is that safe? To I say? think so, and I, I, I don't have hard data, but yeah. I think we're the largest whole cone hop user in the world now. Um, just whole cone in general. Just a whole yeah. cone in general. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I think it's true. Um, yeah, so we started out with whole cone hops, and we played around with pellets back in uh, early 80s and pellets were a relatively new uh, invention back then. They'd been around but uh, mm -hmm. the industry hadn't really wholeheartedly converted over to it. I mean, at that point Coors was still whole cone hops, Anheuser-Busch was still whole cone hops for all their production um, and they slowly changed their process. I mean whole cone hops have some um, really nice attributes but they're also a pain mm -hmm. uh, to deal with. I mean, yeah. uh, Harder to store, they you know it, they degrade and oxidize quicker than you know pellet in a vacuum sealed bag. Um, take up more space. There you know there's a, a lot of reasons why the industry sort of moved away from them. Um, the downside is though you know when the pellet is made, it's it's ruptured, it's you know hammer milled, and we did some trials where we took the same hop lots and we pelletized some and we um, you know used some whole and tasted the beers and. Uh, the, the pellets certainly improved extraction, so that was one thing. You got a higher yield. Because you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're freeing it, or right. opening it up. And yeah, um, and so they're more efficient to use than, than whole leaf are. Uh, but the flavors were different, and not that they were bad. They were just, you know, different character and quality to them, and, and um, we opted not to switch. But, uh, you know, th that's not to say that today we don't play around with all sorts of hot products. We do. So we. Our pale ale still all whole cone hops. Our you know traditional beers are still the way we brewed them, um, but new new beers we we feel we've got uh, more freedom uh, you know for not altering the recipe. Speaking of oxidation and, and that, uh, I've had the pleasure to brew with your R&D team a couple times here before and walking through the process. One of the things I thought that was really cool is you guys do. I think it's nitrogen flush and wet milling. Mm -hmm. um, like you guys are very cognizant of, of oxygen pickup. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Of sure. Some of the things you do to keep, uh, you know, staling agents out of out yep. of your finished beer. So uh, our milling process is called a steep condition mill. Um, so it's not true wet milling. So there had been a period when um, there was what's called you know truly wet milling, and I don't know that there's too many of those operating globally anymore, mm -hmm. where the the malt was really soaked in a big hopper and it became soft and sort of mushy. Uh, and then they would sort of send it through the mill. Um, the downside is you're sort of starting that mashing process in your in your hopper, mm -hmm. um, and you know the the bottom of the tank is different than the top of the tank as far as contact time and and all that. So there's a lot of variables that were introduced with that, um, and that f fell out of favor to steep condition milling. So that's um, those mills are produced by both Hoopman and Steinecker, both have large um, steep condition mills. And in that process, the, the mold is only wet for about a minute. Mm. Um, so it travels from a dry hopper through a steeping chamber where you can control the temperature, so you do start mashing then. Uh, but it's just about a minute uh, into the process. Um, the, I guess the positives of that is you're not dealing with dust, so mm. you, you know you don't have an explosion hazard, and mm. uh, malt mills do blow up uh, occasionally. And grain handling, you know, dust is is a hazard from both health and and uh, explosion concerns. Um, and we use deaerated water, so we actually have a, a mm. deaeration system, so that water is low in oxygen as well, um, and the mill is flush with nitrogen, um, so there's a, a control of that. Um, and then um, 
in, in our milling process, you didn't add water in that crushing process and then water in the bottom of the gully uh, that you pump out of into the mash tun. And so you're actually starting all your mashing processes there. And so you can uh, effectively get uh, protolytic rest. I mean, you can do various things by changing the temperatures of the different waters that go in. So mm. the, the steeping water for minutes can be at one temperature. The water in the um, milling process could be a different temperature. And you go into your mash tun and you can do a, you know, upward infusion or whatever you're going to do That's there. That's interesting, actually working so, that into yeah, the Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty critical yeah. thing. A lot of those enzymes react very quickly. And so that minute or two or three you can change the dynamic of your wort by controlling those temperatures uh, in those processes. So we do monkey with those um, seasonally and, and um, by brand as well. All right, uh, we've talked about celebration a lot, and one of my like core memories as a home brewer is, um, you know, they, they do the California State Homebrew Competition, and it's held at Anchor Steam, or it used to be held at Anchor Steam every year. Uh, and you guys would always send a keg of celebration before it was out on the market, you know. Mm -hmm. And all us homebrewers, we loved it, you know. It's like, oh, we get to drink celebration. It's just a great memory, and being at Anchor is pretty cool. Yep. Um, so let's talk about Anchor a little, and kind of the state of the beer industry with with what happened, uh, you know, with them. Do you have any insight or, or just thought? on that and kind of the, you know, what's happening in the beer industry in general. Yeah, so I mean, um, it, those who follow the beer industry, you know, certainly have seen uh, its ups and downs over, well, over my history, so over 45 years or so, I, I've seen, you know, some real tough times and I've seen some good times and, you know, we, we've had, you know, sort of zero growth before um, in the 90s. and. Um, you know, we're at a place now where the drinkers definitely changed, and, and uh, you know, I think some of the trends were happening pre-COVID, but COVID probably accelerated things a bit across, you know, the full spectrum of, of life in America, really. Um, and, you know, the, the, I guess the health craze to some degree might have prompted some of those changes, people going to what they might perceive as a healthier alcohol, uh, something that doesn't have as many calories, and carbs as beer, um, and so, you know, the advent of, of seltzers and, um, you know, alcoholic tonics and, and those sorts of things uh, certainly took some of the craft beer drinkers uh, in a different direction. Um, and I uh, said, you know, during the pandemic, um, brewers who had a on-premise focus, uh, and some of them only had on-premise, they were really hurt. and. Um, Many of them, you know, cease to, to to be in existence, um, but it certainly changed consuming uh, habits as well. Um, you know, on-premise sales have not recovered from um, the post-pandemic. They're you know down ten or fifteen percent below where they were going into it, uh, and you know that was the lifeblood of many craft breweries, um, Anchor included. Um, you know, if you've got I think they were probably in the 30 or 40 percent on premise, certainly in Northern California, probably very uh, high on premise volumes. And so when that shut down, that, that certainly put the, the hurt on the company overall. Um, but, you know, Anchor is a unique company. I mean, they're in San Francisco in a really expensive place to do business. They're in a brewery that is uh, romantic as hell and beautiful. Um, but not real efficient, um, and you know they have uh, you know they're landlocked and and had uh, you know some um, older infrastructure, um, and, and they're you know they're not unique. There's uh, you know a lot of breweries in America that I think you know went through the pandemic and came out not very healthy, and you know that's that's a case where you know sad to see what happened, but the sort of the handwriting was on the wall. Um, you know, it's harder to be a small regional, a small small brewer that tries to go national. Uh, if you're a small regional brewer that focuses on your home market uh, and you've you know, been able to establish yourself there and you can survive off those kinds of volumes, you know, whether you're in Portland or Seattle or Denver or wherever, you know, some breweries, business models have been able to survive and, and prosper with the changing consumer. Um, but the industry in general is not super healthy. I mean, if you look at the largest brewers to the smallest, nobody's, very few are growing much. Um, a lot of people are flat and, you know, f flat's considered good in, in a lot of people's minds these days. Um, will we get back to robust growth again? 
I don't know if it'll be robust. Hopefully we'll get back to some growth as the industry goes. Um, the other factor that's impacted uh, many of us is, is uh, input costs have gone mm. uh, through the roof. Um, you know, with uh, what's happened in Ukraine, that really put uh, a big focus on small grains. And so wheat and barley and oats and, you know, grains that brewers use have all gone up significantly in cost. Yeah, um, a lot of those, that, that's a growing region. A lot of those malt, malt houses are over there. And then also like the shipping cost have gone. Yeah, through, every, yeah. It, just everything across, yeah. you know, energy was up. So bottles and cans cost more, um, you know, the, all the inputs um, went up well above inflation. And, and so, um, you know, a lot of brewers have tried to recoup some of that uh, by raising prices. So now beer is also considered to be a little bit priced uh, out of, uh, of the competitive set with spirits and, and wine in, in some cases. Uh, spirits certainly are cheaper for you know, a drink than uh, a beer is if you're buying a, a bottle, not, not if you go to a bar necessarily. But, um, so that's, I think, impacted a lot of breweries as well is that you know, they're no longer as, as competitive. And if you're a you know, price sensitive shopper and you see a you know, ten dollar six pack, and you see a um, you know a bottle of booze for you know twenty bucks that is equivalent to you know five six packs or whatever. Um, you know, some people are making those choices. If so. that's the choice, yeah. If you're looking at it strictly from a alcohol, alcohol standpoint, yeah, yeah. alcohol yeah. delivery standpoint. So, you know, I think there's a variety of things that uh, you know have all sort of aligned, unfortunately, to to make it more, much more difficult to. Um, to do business, certainly in California. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the other thing. We've got, you know, very expensive everything. Power is much more costly here than just about every other state in the country. Um, you know, we got uh, a, a lot of you know, minimum wage things, and so a lot of brewers that have restaurants and pubs are, are struggling with just a lot of those costs that are, um, you know, present in doing business in California. So question, kind of, yeah, the changing consumer, let's go back on that. And, and one of the things, you know, like when, I remember when like hazy IPAs come out, you know, a lot of what I'll call old school brewers, like, ah, uh, you know, it's garbage, you know, whatever. But uh, it intrigued me because from, I, I love the science, the engineering, like, oh, it's easy to do that. And no, it's not. There's water chemistry and things. So I've always gravitated towards um, new, new styles and things like that. And then more recently, the um, uh, seltzers, hard seltzers and mm -hmm. things like that. And it, that interests me too, because it was like mead making, you know, like there's nutrigen, nutrients that are involved. It's, the, the process has always gravitated me towards it. But then I've heard people in the industry say, um, when we chase these trends or chase these styles, we're actually leading people away from beer. And I never thought about it that mm -hmm. way. So I'm just interested to hear your take on that. As a, a lover of science and engineering, I want to learn it all and I want to make it, but yep. I, I'd hate to hurt the industry that I love, right? Of, of buy, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, you you got to respect what the consumer wants to buy too. I mean, um, you know, it'd be great if we could just be making pale ale and that's the only thing we did. That's just not where the realities are of the marketplace. And, and um, so I, I think as long as we're true to our brewing roots and we still make, you know, great beers and focus on beer, which we you know certainly do and will always do, um, you know, being able to offer a consumer that's, you know, they're gluten intolerant and they want to drink something different, um, you know, if we don't provide it, somebody else is going to. And so uh, I guess it's romantic to think that we can keep the beer industry whole by, by only focusing on beer, but I really think it comes down to what the consumer preference is. And, you know, are we uh, helping drive the consumer into different products? Maybe. Uh, but I think if we don't do it, somebody else will get into that space and take your customer away from you. So if you can at least figure out a way to you know, still be true to who you are uh, from a, uh, a, you know, a brewing uh, pedigree or from a, a, a beverage producing pedigree uh, and retain those consumers with your brand family, hopefully they'll switch back and forth between your products and, mm. and still consume beer versus just saying, I'm not gonna do that and have them go somewhere else. And yeah, I love that answer. That's a, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're, we're not, um, at least our company, and I'd say most companies, we're not at liberty to not listen to the consumer and, and do what we wanna do. I mean, we used to be that way. I mean, it used to be, we're gonna brew what we, what we like to drink and so be it, uh, take it or leave it. Um, but, you know, when you've got, um, you know, thousand employees and, and you've got to, you know, make sure that you're, you know, trying to smartly keep the company growing and, and profitable. Um, you sort of have to do what you have to do to, to really figure that out. And, and it's, it's a moving target. I mean, the consumer's 
quite fickle these days and mm -hmm. they're changing you know preferences all the time and and i think that's just the world we live in now um, you know most of the legal age drinkers today you know grew up on flavored uh, uh, you know sugary sodas and and other things that were sweet and not hoppy and and um, so I, and convenient. Uh, so I think you know you need to, to understand that that this consumer is coming from a different place than uh, than we did. You know, thirty. Yeah, you're seeing that flavor balance change. Like IPAs now, like fifty IBUs, kind of like the max. Like mm -hmm. you know, and everything and everything's more sweeter. Uh, you know, the balance is kind of yeah. geared more towards the market you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Um, here, here, here's one for you. Um, yeah, I've asked that. What do you see as like the next trend in brewing? You know, like we hazy IPAs became big, and cold IPA is a big thing right now. These kind of like dry. Like, do you do you see any new thing that uh, you know is, is kind of on the horizon? That um, you know, as far as um, you know, what the next style is, I I, uh, I only wish I knew. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, we're we're uh, you know we're getting into areas that are at the fringe of. of traditional brewing, but um, we, we still try to keep our traditional brewers hat on. So we are producing non-alcoholic beers. We're actually packaging some today out in our new can-do facility. Um, and it's, you know, it's something that uh, I, I traveled to Europe a fair amount and um, I'd go to Spain and Germany and, you know, NAs were a, a big thing and, and, you know, more than 10% of the, of what people drank. And you know, as the sensibility about alcohol started to become more prevalent in, in society, um, you, know, you go to lunch, you know, with a, a German brewer, and they're not going to be drinking a, a five or six percent alcohol beer. You know, two or three of them at lunch. It, it's um, you know, uh, not not it's frowned on and, and not really done so much anymore. Um, but they will drink a zero zero, and um, you know a lot of the European beers. The zero zero is really prominent on the label, so they can put it on their table and show, "I here, I'm a responsible mm -hmm. uh, person. I'm not drinking you know, three beers at lunch. I'm having you know zero zero beer at lunch." Um, so I started seeing that, and I and I came back to our team and said, "You know, I think NAs are going to be a thing. This was probably starting I don't know seven or eight years ago." And you know, you look at the U.S. Marketplace, and it's like, well, it's only one less than one percent of what's sold in America. It's it's not going to be like it is in Europe anytime soon. At the time, it was. At, right, right. at the time, yeah. well, and it still is. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a little over one yeah. percent. It's still a very small segment of the U.S. market, but it's growing. It's the most rapidly growing segment. So I think, uh, you know, people who do enjoy beer, but for whatever reason, you know, choose not to have alcohol, um, are looking for tasty, good alternatives, and so that's what we've been working on to produce flavorful. NAs that you know are as reminiscent as a real beer as possible, and it's not easy. It's uh, yeah. technologically challenging, um, and you do need to you know pasteurize those products. You know could harbor pathogenic bacteria. You know mm -hmm. beer is 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 quite safe. It's not totally safe, but it's quite safe from any pathogen growing in it. And uh, but once you get the alcohol out of it, um, and you still have some residual malt sugars for flavor and body. Um, you've got food there for potentially, you know, uh, microbes to grow on. So uh, you've got to be a lot more careful from a, a, a health con concern um, uh, with NA products. So we built this new facility that uh, has got all the capability to do flash pasteurization, tunnel pasteurization, uh, blending and batching so we can we can do other fermented and non-fermented kinds of drinks, and we're just commissioning that facility. That's right the can-do facility yep. you mentioned. Awesome. So that's what, what other kind of stuff is going to come out? So the NA uh, hop waters, things like that. Yeah, we're doing hop waters, and you know, hop waters are sort of in the same boat. You either need to be super careful on the micro side. Um, um, Acidify it, things like that. Yeah, yeah. pH has got to be right, and and uh, you know hops come out of fields, and and you know they're they're exposed to all sorts of things in, in the environment. Uh, if you've been up to you know hop processing, mm -hmm. there, you know hops are dried and loaded on a floor, yeah. um, you know, and scooped around with forklifts, and and so they're not really sterile uh, in the scheme of things. So uh, you can pick up uh, you, know, you know all sorts of microbes. So you've got to be pretty careful to make sure that the product is clean and and um, you know, all of our hop waters we send out for third-party analysis for uh, any pathogenic bacteria we do in-house micro on it and uh, having the can-do facility will allow us to do a, a light pasteurization step on that as well awesome looking forward to having some of the products that come out of there yep so, so are we yeah well thank you for your time it's been, it been a, a pleasure yeah pleasure
All right, so I like to ask people this, uh, what's your desert island beer? So if you can only have one beer for the rest of your life, what would it be? So you know, mine is Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. What is your desert island beer? It would be yours, New School Kicks. What? <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, so thank you so much great, for that. Yeah, I appreciate it. My that. pleasure. Thanks for being up here, man. Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah.